Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this short game to the video, we're going to be discussing two pieces of news. The first of which is Intel allegedly switching towards AMD for graphics card licensing, and then we're going to touch on Intel's upcoming memory technologies. But because, at least in my opinion, it's probably the more tasty of the two pieces of news, let's focus our attention for a moment on Intel and AMD and Nvidia, also known as the Triangle of Love. So just to give us some context, back in 2011, Intel signed a graphics licensing deal with Team Green, also known as NVIDIA, and this cost them a pretty penny over the past five years, about 1.5 billion. Now, just so we're all clear, this is not to say that there are CUDA cores inside a graph, uh, sorry, inside the inbuilt graphics card in an Intel CPU. What it is doing, however, is basically saying that we are licensing the ability to create a GPU. So, basically, when you create a graphics card now, you need to do it in a unified fashion. In other words, there are hundreds, most likely thousands, of little processors inside the GPU which can carry out numerous tasks. For example, they might handle geometry processing, they might handle physics, they might handle lighting, they might handle texturing, they might handle a dozen different things for different portions of the frame over a second. The fact of the matter is they're no longer fixed function where you have texture mapping units, you have uh, geometry units and whatever else. Therefore, it's very easy to infringe on someone else's patent. And that's why there is a lot of legal toing and throwing between the likes of Samsung and Nvidia and God knows whomever else. So basically, this money that Intel have been sending over to NVIDIA has, for lack of a better word, been protection money. It's to essentially say, we do not want to be sued. Because without coughing this up, one of the other companies who have created the GPU technology could theoretically open up a lawsuit and slap Intel. So all of the research and development is done internally by Intel, but it's just almost impossible not to infringe on a pattern. It's almost for lack of a better way of putting it, like me being the original creator of a wheel, and then you trying to think of any other way to make a traditional car run, or a cycle, or any other thing. The only thing you could possibly do is maybe use tracks, or, you know, a log. That's basically your options at that point. And it doesn't really work, because good luck trying to steer. And that's why, ultimately, you would have to most likely come to me for licensing out a wheel. And that's for a cruder way of putting it anyway, essentially what Intel have been paying NVIDIA. Okay, so you're going to say to yourself, okay, I get that, but why would they then say, well, GAMD, you're our rival, here's money. Well, this is where it gets a bit trickier. You see, Intel and AMD don't actually hate each other technically. They have worked with one another before. For example, the x86-64 instructions that Intel currently deploy essentially originated from AMD, and as well as some of the instructions that Intel uh, created are now found themselves in AMD processors. Basically, the companies have worked together when it's mutually beneficial for A, and for B, it's going to cost Intel less money, which is really the B end and be all and end all. And from Intel's point of view, I can kind of see where they're coming from. It's like Imagine you're doing all the research, you're doing all the development, you're taking all the risks, basically, on the technology falling on its face, yet you're still having to cough up to Bob for basically using that technology. So Intel are going to be getting a better deal, allegedly, from AMD, and they're going to charge them less money, AMD to Intel. So Intel get a better deal, AMD get free money, and... Basically, everyone's a winner, apart from, I guess, technically, NVIDIA. I'm not upset about this, and I can definitely... I can definitely see why they would do it. After all, remember, NVIDIA didn't do this back in the day for fun. Um, they actually had a legal settlement with NVIDIA. Intel did sign a patent to cover graphics card licensing, but just to illustrate, it was because of a lawsuit. So I guess there was some animosity there technically as well. It's like if I was Intel, I might be a little petty and <laughs> think to myself, you know what, I'd rather give money to a CPU rival 
that technically, I guess, is more in business than me rather than the company that actually sued me. I might be a little petty like that. Maybe it's just me. And that's just how things go. So let's now switch our attention to Optane SSDs and 3D NAND based SSDs, which are going to be making their way to our various systems in 2017. Of course, all of these, once again, are for Intel. Now, storage technology might sound a lot less interesting to discuss than high-end CPUs, high-end GPUs, and RAM, and God knows whatever else. But ultimately, it's probably as important, if not more important. Imagine how you would be able to operate a computer if the loading times of, let's say, Word suddenly took 10 minutes because your, because your hard drive is incredibly slow. How sucky would that be? You wouldn't necessarily care if you were able to get 500 frames per second in Doom in the Doom 2016 if the game took 20 minutes to load or you were still relying on tape deck, would you? No, so storage is still very important. Intel will supposedly release multiple 3D NAND based SSDs during 2017. Now, once again, it is important to realize that NAND is not or 3D NAND specifically is not new. Intel are not innovating this in terms of it's not a new technology. For example, the crucial MX 350 gigabyte that we recently reviewed also employs this, and there are other companies that use it as well. Basically, all 3D NAND is is it has memory cells which are not just stacked horizontally, which traditional planar NAND does, but also stacks it in multiple layers. So those layers basically address a twofold issue. The first of which is that it increases the storage space possible, and the second is that it actually, well, costs less money to produce. So, for example, in the case of Micron's technology, which is found in the Crucial MX350 gigabyte, the NAND is set up as a 384 gbit, which is 48 gigabytes per 32 layer 3D TLC. TLC, excuse me. So each memory cell can store up to three uh, bits of data. And because there are 16 of these dies, you just say there's 768 gigabytes totally available on the drive because that's 48 gigabytes in each of these 32 layers, as I just said, times 16 dies equals 768 gigabytes of total space. Okay. So now on to that, there are going to be a slew of different products, and I won't read through all of them, released um, next year. They're going to be released from the first quarter, which include everything from DCP4500 um, all the way down to the um, P4500LP, and these are going to hit mass production. And then you're going to see entry-level devices, which are going to be SATA-based in the second quarter, and then eventually... There are going to be DC 3700 and 3600N VMEs, SSDs, um, and they will start appearing uh, with more storage space in the third quarter of 2017. And then finally, there will be pro versions of these which will launch in the fourth quarter. However, Optane technology will be arriving by the name of, uh, sorry, under both Mansion Beach and Stony Beach platforms. And these will be the Intel Optane 800p memory. Now, this is going to be two faults of technology. One is 16 gigabyte, and the second is 32 gigabyte. Now, it's important to note that we are not, not necessarily talking about DIMMs, and this is most likely instead referring to the size of blocks, which means that it's going to be a significant increase over the current SSD standards, which results theoretically in massive SSD si uh, sizes. So not only does it currently employ the PCI Gen 3.0, um, you're also going to have, of course, M.2241 as well as M.2280. Now, theoretically, the 32 gigabyte does look to be a little bit faster with its random and uh, with its random write speeds as well as sequential write speeds, according to BenchLife. But still, it's very impressive. Now, my whole thing with all of this is it's going to be very interesting to see how this technology adopts to the customer.
From what we understand about Optane SSDs, they were able to achieve about 7.2 times more IOPS at low Q depths and about 5.2 times the IOPS as conventional SSDs at high Q depths and massively lower latency, about eight times lower latency, 10 times the density and up to a thousand times faster than the competition market available, what was available at the time, as well as, well as 1,000 times the endurance. This theoretically means that you shouldn't need to worry about your SSD dying at any point. It will most likely outlive not just you, but the system and pretty much any other components within it. In other words, by the time the SSD is ready for retirement, it still will probably have another like 20 years of life left in it without any difficulty whatsoever. So even in servers and other such devices which are constantly reading and writing from a particular disk, you're going to still have high usage scenario. Anyway, uh, let me know what you thought, thought of the video. Normal things like share, subscribe, comment, give cookies and milk, especially because the YouTube algorithm is being super helpful at the moment and penalizing uh, channels which don't get likes and all that crap. So, yeah, anyway, hope you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.